Good morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. Glad to have each one of you here joining us at Olivet Baptist Church today. We look forward to being in the house of the Lord. Let's stand as we sing this morning, number 532, Higher Ground. I'm pressing on that upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. I trust that's true in our lives and our walk with the Lord. All four stanzas plus a repeat ending at the end. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table land, a higher place. again. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher standing for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just rejoice so much in the greatest privilege in all the world, that's to know the Lord God Almighty is our personal Lord and Savior, to know that, that we are on that, that higher plane. And help us, dear Lord, to delight and to desire to, to walk there with you. I pray that today that you'll honor yourself as we meet together. We come, Lord, not just to encourage ourselves, not just to, to entertain ourselves and, and to have the fellowship, but to honor and glorify you primarily. And so I pray that everything we do will contribute to that end. I pray for each and every one that's here that you'll meet the individual needs and let us dear lord be able to encourage each other in the lord in the way that you would have us to i thank you so much for our nation pray that you just bless and protect us and all that's going on today we just commit ourselves to you help us to make a difference in our world in jesus name we pray amen thank you, you may be seated i'm going to try something i don't normally try on a sunday morning we're going to sing a song that's not in the hymnal. That's not so terribly unusual necessarily, but I'm not even sure who all knows this particular song. I know all the kids from Shawnee Mission Christian School know it, uh, at least in the junior, senior high, because it's been our theme song for the entire year. Uh, it kind of fit along with our theme for our leadership retreat we had way back in, in August, and so we've been singing it on a regular basis. Uh, but it fits so well in, with what uh, pastor is planning to preach about this morning from 2 Corinthians, and so I thought we're going to go ahead and try it. Uh, how many of you look at that and you say, oh yeah, I remember that's an old song. Now it's been around a lot of years. How many of you actually remember this song, know this song? Okay, so a few of you that know it, we'll sing it through a couple of times. 
It's not real terribly difficult, uh, but uh, we'll try to help you learn a good song here this morning as well. From glory to glory, he's changing me, changing me, changing me. His likeness and image to perfect in me, the love of God shown to the world. For he's changing, changing me from earthly things into heavenly. His likeness and image to perfect in me, the love of God shown to the world. Not too terribly difficult. Does it sound familiar to any of the rest of you now that you've heard it? Okay, a few more might have heard it. Okay, let's sing it through again. We'll have to obviously sing it some more because it's a really good song uh, and we'll learn it some more. We'll sing it through one more time this morning, then we'll move on to... Uh, uh, change my heart, O oh God. That's the one coming after this. But from glory to glory, one more time. From glory to glory, he's changing me, changing me, changing me. His likeness and image to perfect in me. The love of God shown to the world for his change. likeness and image to perfect in me the love of God shown to the world then over to 529 change my heart O oh God change my heart O oh God make it ever this morning to all the Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here sharing this day with us and what a beautiful day it is. Uh, first time I think this spring I was sitting at my breakfast table and the sun was actually shining on the table. We've had such a kind of a cloudy spring here but it's a beautiful day and we're glad you're sharing this day with us. Now I didn't meet anybody before the service I didn't already know. I don't know if there's some some guests with us today for the very first time. Uh, it's good to have uh, uh, Chris and Andrew Stone with us again. It's been a long time. Uh, I think Chris said it's kind of kind of strange coming and not having Grandma and Grandpa here since they moved on. And uh, and Chris's special friend Callie. She's been here before. I've met her before. Anybody else though? Somebody sitting next to you hadn't been here in a long time. You'd like to introduce? We certainly want everybody to know that we're glad you're here. Uh, you make our day very special by, by your presence. All right. Well, we're so glad that you're here. Now, both of you got some, uh, some special announcements. I don't know who wants to come first. All right. Oh, 
Good morning. We are here today. We are here to announce that it is, and it is a little early, but I'll tell you why. We are here for Frisbee golf season. It is that time of year again where the camp will be holding its Frisbee golf tournament. And we are here because we try to raise money for the camp. Now, there's a reason why I'm here a little bit early this year. It's because we have a rather hefty goal this year because each year we've been able to raise more money than we had the previous year. So uh, just so you know, our goal this year is about $5,000 for the camp. And if you would, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you would help the camp. We do support the camp in the ministry. Uh, we also do it in the uh, missions field. We support the camp also. So uh, we think this is a great opportunity to help build our camp up. Uh, there's a, quite a few things uh, that they do need, and I was a little unprepared this morning, so I will be coming up about every other week to remind everybody, Mr. Tilson. <laughs> so, uh, just so keep it short. Uh, so, uh, but I want you to keep an uh, eye on your bulletin because this year we have a little bit of a secret plan this year in order to raise money. So you just keep your eye on the bulletin. You see what that is, and that'll also be another way to help us out. We appreciate it. Wow, how do you follow uh, Sean Garvin? <laughs> I'm not so good at that. <laughs> I also want to talk to you about something. Uh, this is actually happens to be here locally here at our church. Uh, I want to talk to you about EDL doors. EDL. They're called electric door locks and basically what they are are doors that allow us to be more secure here at our church and at our school um, one of the things that you guys are are probably aware of are a lot of the things that have happened at the public schools and at the churches here recently and we as a church and as a school need to take measures to correct that here two of the things that we are looking to do or actually two of the doors we are looking to do are here at the office and here at the school entrance and what these doors will allow us to do is basically see somebody before they come to the door, talk to that person, and allow that person either to enter or not to enter. It's something we need to do. It's something that's very highly recommended by officials and by our deacon board. We need to raise $4,000 to complete this. This isn't all of the money that's going to take, but this is what we are short. We really need your help with that. If you want to donate to this, please put door on your checks or on your money that way we can get this project completed and that way we can secure our church and school thank you i'm not here to raise any money <laughs> but i i would just say with what bob said there's four thousand dollars yet to be raised but there's already been i think six given and so uh help out with that uh, teens, pay attention teens and teens parents. Uh, there will be a meeting as, as for the uh, missions trip this summer, there will be a meeting for teens and teens parents down front here right after the morning service. So uh, make sure that you're here and see uh, Pastor Micah and he'll uh, get you all clued in for that. And uh, uh, we finished a season-ending basketball tournament uh, last uh, yesterday afternoon. And so I want to invite the girls' varsity team and coaches and the boys' varsity team and coaches to come right on up here. You notice we have two trophies, and each one of these teams uh, took the consolation championship and received this trophy for uh, fifth place in the tournament. Let's give them a good hand for that. Start out with our girls' teams, coached by uh, 
Brother Scott Edmondson and Marlena Zink and Michael Kletzka is not here. He attends another church, but we're glad for them. Uh, I just will say this personally, both of these teams played probably their best game of the whole year yesterday. And uh, I just really was impressed. Uh, Brother Edmondson, who won awards? Uh, Rachel Kletzka and Ruth uh, won Christian Character Awards. And uh, Danielle Wallace and Ruth also got all tournament players. All, all right. Players. Good. Give these girls a good hand. And then we get to the boys. I've just been so impressed with uh, John Guess. John Guess and Kevin Leak are the coaches. John has just been bringing this team along uh, little by little by little, and they've just been improving and, and just getting better. Now, the team is getting better, but some of the players are not. <clears throat> right, Isaiah? <laughs> Uh, right near the end of the game yesterday, uh, Isaiah went to guard this one guy, and just as he got to the back of this one guy, this guy decided he'd move, and uh, you can look at Isaiah. He cut the eyebrow there, and the other guy cut the back of his head. We had blood everywhere, <laughs> and uh, uh, got it all under control, but the boys won and did a tremendous job, and so John, who got awards? Thompson got Christian character, and Daniel got honorable mention on all term or all conference. All right, give him a good hand. Okay. <laughs> now, Friday, right, Scott? Yes, sir. Friday is the uh, uh, time that we give out awards to all of these athletes in basketball. Uh, I encourage you to come at Pi Social, yes. Social. It's a benefit for the seniors. And uh, so come and be a part of it. Encourage these kids. And thank you, teams and coaches, for everything. <laughs> All right. This evening... This evening is a big time. Folks, don't, don't miss this evening. You, if you love good music, this is the evening to come because uh, Faith Baptist Bible College will have their orchestra and handbell choir. And so come here, 6 o'clock. It would be a great, great time. Uh, we will need help this morning uh, to clear everything out of here and uh, get, get things so they can set up the orchestra and the handbells. They cover the whole platform and everything. So if you could help this morning clear things out, that, that would be helpful. And uh, Marlene, we have everything. We have all things ready for the food. So uh, just come, bring somebody with you so that, uh, so that you can enjoy and they can enjoy this thing. Now, uh, Brother Edmondson said, please tell everybody that this Wednesday is Stromboli night. Wednesday. Everybody loves Stromboli. And so uh, you come. Senior class is having a uh, fundraiser this coming Wednesday night. Come for that, if you would, please. Uh, then March 9, 10, and 11 is Missions Conference. Steve and Michelle were at our house last night. And uh, we had a good time talking, and so uh, I have some answers for people that, that need answers. But uh, you come. We're looking forward to, to it these three days at a special time. Next week, we'll have some sign-up sheets out for those that are coming for men's breakfast and other things. So uh, be, be aware of that and put this on your calendar. Don't forget it. Uh, it this is a highlight. And, uh, and Steve will just challenge us with his preaching. So come and just be a part of that. Gentlemen, uh, would you come with a morning offering, please? Father, we, we want to thank you for this day. 
you have been so good to us. We are thankful for uh, helping the teams, all the travels, all the games, keeping them safe. And we thank you for the coaches, for their uh, volunteering and sacrificial effort. Lord, we just ask that tonight would just be a blessing to all that come. And we ask now that you would take this offering, use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So much for that. It's also good to see the words up there. Follow along as she plays that beautiful song for us. Give you another opportunity to sing as well. One more, one more chance this morning, number 564. 564. Stand with me as we sing all four stanzas. More about Jesus, what I know. That's why we're here today. Learn more about him. We can take with us throughout this week. All four stanzas, 564. More about Jesus, what I know. More of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love. Oh, 
I should be back this evening. Choir, we are still having choir practice at 5 o'clock and the uh, ensemble that practiced last week, I need you here at 4.30. In spite of the fact that the orchestra will be here setting up, we'll practice downstairs then this evening, okay? Make sure you greet two or three people now as the choir is dismissed, as the children go downstairs for children's church, or they need to wait. They need to wait. Children, you gotta wait. Sorry about that. Special music is over, then you may go downstairs. Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verses 1 through 35. Exodus chapter 34, 29 through 35. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai until Moses had come speaking with them he put a veil on his face but when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him he took the veil off until he came out and he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded and the children of Israel saw the face of Moses that the skin of Moses face shone and Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. My hope is built on nothing less Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Darkness fails his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all the 
appreciate that so very much the confidence that we have being built upon that solid rock if you'll take your bibles please turn with me to second corinthians chapter three. Second corinthians chapter three still in this third chapter going to be coming down to these last two three verses here at the end of chapter three that confidence that we have that solid rock upon which our faith is built I tell you, it's the most wonderful thing in all the world, the excitement, the confidence that we ought to have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty is the most beautiful word. We think of physical liberty when people are in bondage and many people all around the world would just just be thrilled to have the liberty that you and I enjoy here in the United States of America. But even more than that political liberty is that of spiritual liberty, being in bondage to sin and guilt, struggling all through life trying to atone for our own sins. People do all kinds of things to try to be right with God. And many times it's a miserable existence. And I literally mean that. I've seen people trying to pay for their sins, crawling on their knees, blocks, uh, kissing statues, uh, doing all kinds of things, trying to find that liberty and that freedom for their heart and their soul. Verse 17 says, Now the Lord is that spirit, our God. He is spirit. Yes, Jesus Christ took on human flesh, and and now God himself has a bodily presence. Jesus took that body to heaven with him, but our God is spirit. He's everywhere, and when we accept Christ as our Savior, that spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord, becomes our, our indwelling Holy Spirit in our life. What a beautiful thing that is. Let's bow in a word of prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, as we continue through this particular portion of Scripture, I just pray to you, Lord, that you'll open our hearts and our minds, but not just to understand, but to, to make that application to our lives. Lord, we ought to be the most exciting people in all the world, thrilled with our relationship with you, that liberty that we have, wanting to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, it's a sad thing when Christians lose that perspective. Help us today, dear Lord, to just realize what you have for us and to desire to be all that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This liberty that we have, the liberty to be in his presence, is really what chapter 3 has been all about. If you'll notice there in verse 16, it, can, it says, Nevertheless, when it shall turn, when the heart, and that's the it, we've looked at this before, when a person's heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, just for a quick review, some of you have not been with us the last couple of weeks. This veil that we're talking about here is both the veil that Moses put upon his face when he came out of the presence of the Lord and his his face shone and it, it terrified the people. That veil was to protect them from that glory and we also talked about the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the tabernacle or the temple That veil that separated the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God, the people could could not go beyond that veil. They could not stand in the very presence of God. Except once a year when the high priest would enter in within the veil, make the sacrifice on that day of atonement. That was the only exception when they could go within that veil. That veil separated to protect people from the glory of God. Now, how does this all fit together? And so you notice there in verse 16, when 
when a person's heart turns to the Lord, then the veil shall be taken away. As a Christian, there's nothing that separates us from the glory of God. There's nothing that separates us from his intimate presence in our life. That veil was ripped in twain. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, the veil in the temple rent from the top to the bottom. There was an earthquake. God himself tore that veil apart to signify that the presence, the way to the presence of God has been prepared and made through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we can have that liberty of verse 17. Because, because Christ has, has taken away that, uh, that problem of sin that separated us from God and his presence. And we now can come boldly into his presence through the person of Jesus Christ. Now verse 18 continues. But we all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. That word open face literally and this, it should have been translated this way to, to keep it within the context. Literally is the word unveiled. When I say literally, that word open there is, is the word that takes the word veil and puts the negative in front of it in the Greek. So literally, it's an unveiled face. There's nothing now that separates us from being able to look upon the very presence of our God. There's an unveiled, an open face now because of our relationship with Jesus Christ that we can come directly into his presence and enjoy the, the presence of the Lord, that freedom that is ours. Now go back to verse 7. This is chapter 3, verse 7. And we're going to pick up the idea of Moses again very briefly and tie it all together. In verse 7, if the ministry, the ministration or the ministry of death written and graven in stones, that's the law, the Old Testament law, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Now, that law and the glory of the law being fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that law really was that veil that kept people from coming right into the presence of God because it condemned them. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. He took care of that. And, uh, and now we have that sweet, wonderful privilege of coming directly to our God through the person of Jesus Christ. No longer through the law or the law-keeping system. Now, the reason I turn back now to verse 7 was simply to illustrate, once again, the fact that Moses had this veil over his face because of the glory of God that took residence with him. He was in the presence of God when he came down off that mount. This is with the second set of commandments. He came down off that mount, his faith shone, and it terrified the people. He radiated the glory of God. Why did he radiate the glory of God? Because he had been in the presence of the Lord. I want to go back to Exodus 34, the passage that we had for our scripture reading this morning. In Exodus chapter 34, and I'm going to pick this up at the end of the chapter here, because it talks about Moses after the initial time when he came down off that mountain, he put that veil over his face. However, when he went in to converse with the Lord... He took the veil off. And so you see in verse 34, But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was com commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. And so as Moses went in to speak with the Lord... There was no veil. God spoke to him face to face. God communed with him. And because of his presence with the Lord, when he left again, his face radiated. The glory reflected that glory of the Lord. As Moses talked to the people, he put a veil over his face to kind of to help them uh, and deal with the situation. But every time he went in to speak with the Lord then, that, that was a recharging effect upon his face, and his face radiated that. Now, the reason I refer to that 
is because of our context here, what we've been talking about, is that you and I ought to reflect the glory of the Lord in our continents, in what we do. This is not just for Moses. As New Testament Christians, we ought to be reflecting the fact that, uh, that we have been with Jesus. Look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, Peter and John, they've been preaching contrary to the command of the council not to preach in the name of Jesus. Uh, they put Jesus to death. He's been resurrected. Uh, Peter and John, the other apostles, are preaching about the resurrection. They've been arrested. And uh, they were very bold in their defense. And the reason I'm pointing out verse 13 is about his, his enemies, the, the Jewish uh, council there. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, meaning that they were not highly educated people, they were fishermen. And uh, they saw that they were bold, even in spite of the fact that they had little uh, theological training and, and education. They marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. It showed. People could tell. People ought to be able to tell that we've been with Jesus. If we've been with Jesus, it ought to show in our face. It ought to show in our attitude. It ought to show in our actions. People ought to be able to tell there's something very different about that individual. And when they begin to put two and two together, they realize it's because they've been with Jesus. Now, back in verse uh, chapter 3 of uh, 2 Corinthians, verse 17 again. Now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What is that liberty? Well, it's the liberty to come before the presence of the Lord and enjoy his presence. It's that liberty that comes when Christ does a work in our life and then we freely talk about him with others. We share the things that we know about him. Our life takes on a freedom that we had never known before. Because of being with Jesus, it frees us to be all that he wants us to be. Now, this is all because of the Spirit of God. You'll see that in verse 17, and later on you'll see it in verse 18 as well. It's the work of the Holy Spirit upon our life. Now, once again, in summary, the last couple of weeks as we've been in chapter 3, it's all been about the contrast between the Mosaic Law, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. The New Covenant was the promise God gave Israel that he would send his spirit, and that spirit would indwell the believer. The very spirit of God would come upon individuals when they accepted Christ as their Savior, and they would be born of the spirit, born again. That's what salvation is all about. We belong to the Lord. We are his. So this freedom is only possible because of the work of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. This is what Jesus promised in John chapter 4 in verse 24. Talking to the Samaritan woman, Jesus said, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That was introducing the new covenant to her. That was telling her that, yes, this time is coming soon when we'll be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. Folks, we don't realize how blessed we are. I mean, when you study other religions, and you realize all that they go through trying to, to relieve that sense of guilt, trying to make things right with an almighty God, to realize that Jesus Christ paid it all, and he saves us by his blood, he gives us his Holy Spirit, we have that new life within ourselves, and we can, can, can have that privilege of representing him. Now, that leads us into verse 18, chapter 3, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glory, uh, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Verse 18 begins, but we all, and all means all. This is not just the apostles. This is not just those that are the Christian leaders. 
Every single born-again Christian, born of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God residing in his life, has the great privilege of being able to come straight to the Lord. Straight to him. We don't go through some priest. We don't go through some other individual. It's a personal relationship with Almighty God through the person of Jesus Christ. Each and every one of us. And then chapter 3 verse 18 continues to say then with that unveiled face. As we look into that mirror, that glass. Now the word beholding as in a glass is all one word. And it's really that word of, of, of kind of fixating your, your thoughts upon. It's the idea of beholding and then kind of reflecting. It's, it's, a, it's a big word that, that's hard to translate into English. It has this idea of both beholding and reflecting. And so it's as in a glass or as in a mirror. But we're not looking at ourselves. When we think of this mirror, what we're seeing is we're seeing the reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're seeing him. And as we focus upon him, the glory of the Lord, then we are changed into the same image. We're changed into his image. We become more and more like him. That's the beauty of the Christian life, is that we are saved. We're made his. We're given his spirit. And then our whole life is one of growing more and more like Christ until that time he takes us home to be with him there in glory. We are changed. Now, that change is not something that we manufacture. We're not changing ourselves. That would be an impossibility. No, it's passive and it's tense. We are being changed. He is working in our heart and our life. The Holy Spirit is changing us into that image. What we do is to behold him. As we focus... In this, this mirror, this looking glass that, that, that reflects the glory of Jesus Christ. As we see him in scripture. As we see him uh, in the word of God. And, and, and we see him in our own life. Then we become more and more like him. Growing and changing all of the time. Now this is all by the spirit of God. You notice how verse 18 ends? As by the spirit of the Lord. It's not our self-effort. No, our effort is that in just simply beholding him. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more we will become like him in every way. It's all by the Spirit of God working in our heart and our life. Now, that word changed, verse 18, 318, that word changed, that word is the word transformed. Now, I know we all have changes, but this is more than just a subtle change. This is more than just changing clothes. No, this is a transformation that totally revolutionizes one's entire life. We are transformed. This same word was used in Matthew 17 and verse 2. When the Lord Jesus Christ upon the Mount of Transfiguration was transfigured before them. I mean, his face shone, his garments shone, radiated with the brightness what those disciples saw on the Mount of Transfiguration was something they had never seen before. This wasn't just a, a minor change. This was a transformation. He was radiating the glory of God. And they had that, that privilege of being there and beholding that as Jesus was transfigured there before them. This is a, this is a total change into a new form. This word... Back in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, verse 18 again, the word being changed is the same word from which we get the word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Now that's quite a change, isn't it? You know, as it, as it changes from this poor little thing crawling on the leaf to something that can fly and the beauty of a butterfly and all that's there. That's the same basic Greek word that we've got right here. That's what it means to be transformed. So when we look at verse 18, as we look in this, this glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed. We're being changed into the same image, the image of Christ. We are being transformed. And I can't emphasize enough. The transformation is something that is supernatural. It's not just that we changed and turned over a new leaf. It's not just that we stopped one bad habit and 
started doing some other things. It's not just a minor change. It is a total transformation of who we are. We are new people in Christ. And that ought to be evident. People ought to be able to see that glory of the Lord. Now, being changed in the image of Christ. You say, well, what does that look like? Well, you have to read your Bible. You read your Bible, and you, you read about Jesus and how he interacted with people and the character and all that he had there. The character of Jesus Christ was something very, very beautiful. Oh, yes. Yes, it was very offensive to those that, that did not want to change, that did not want to acknowledge Jesus as their Savior. But the beauty of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be the same thing people see in us. This is God's plan for us. Back in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 and verse 29 says that, that this is God's plan for us from the very beginning. For each and every one of us, we all. Uh, Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. To be conformed to the image of his son. That is God's plan and purpose for each and every one of us. Now, I need to make another note here in verse 18, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And that is the fact that we are changed into the same image. We are changed is a continual process. Okay, it's not a once for all thing. It's a continual process. It's, it's, it's a present passive verb. Present means continually happening we are continually being changed he goes on to say from glory to glory from one degree of glory to another degree of glory we'll never reach perfection in this life but we're continually being changed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ from one degree of glory to another it's a glorious thing to be saved a brand new Christian my what a marvel of the grace of God to see somebody's life change just overnight. I mean, they get saved and all of a sudden they've got a whole new life. That night when I got saved, I went home. My mother said I couldn't stop smiling. You know, I just had this great big grin from ear to ear. You know, she knew something was strange, wasn't sure what it was. And it wasn't drugs or anything like that, you know. Something had happened. I'd accepted Christ. It changed my life. And, of course, the next night she had the same experience of accepting the Lord as her Savior and uh, just changed our whole family to come to know Jesus Christ. What a glorious thing it is. That's a degree of glory. To be a baby Christian is a glorious thing. But, you know, the Christian life is growing from glory and experiencing new steps of glory. From glory to a greater degree of glory. Becoming more and more about Christ, letting people see Christ in our life, being transformed from the inside out, not just some kind of a minor change, but that glorious change as we become more and more like Christ. The sad thing is that so many people do not want to change, even Christians. Now, unsaved people, man, they don't want to change. Uh, and, but many, many Christians are the same way. I, I can't tell you how many times people have said, well, quit trying to change me. Well, what do you want me to do? I mean, <laughs> folks, that's my job. <laughs> what do you mean you don't want to be changed? You want to stay the way you are? I mean, it's obvious that you're not happy. It's obvious that things aren't going right. It's obvious that there's a lot of things that could change. Why don't you want to change? Why don't you want to grow? You know, change is threatening to a lot of people. Trying to think through why. Why is change so threatening? Well, I think mainly it's because we do everything we can to maintain a certain self-image. A certain self-image. We see ourselves, we want to see ourselves anyway in a certain light. We want people to see us in a certain way. We want people to see us as mature, self-sufficient, competent. Uh, we want people to believe that we have it all together. And therefore, there's a certain image that we want to portray. We certainly don't want to be seen as weak. You know, if, if people see us as, as weak, then they're going to take advantage of us. And so this whole idea of being self-reliant and self-sufficient 
has been so promoted among most of us that, that we've accepted that as the ideal of life. That's what we ought to be. We ought to be this autonomous individual that's got it all put together. Folks, that's proudful and so self-deceptive. Look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3, Paul says, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So many of us want so badly to think of ourselves in ways that really aren't true. On the inside, we realize, no, there's a lot of deficiencies. But on the outside, we're trying so hard to communicate this image. We're trying so hard to to, to make sure everybody sees us as this individual that's got it all put together. And folks, that totally totally destroys the idea of growth. You see, growth is that kind of a thing that that means we've got to make changes. An anti-growth attitude. If one cannot be seen as having any faults then he cannot admit to having any, right? He must defend his actions as being who he is. And you've heard it and I've heard it. Well, that's just the way I am. You know, can't you take me for who I am? And when a person is being challenged to change, then quite often he will attack and, uh, and try to do everything he can to challenge the idea that he ought to be growing. And he'll attack those that try to help him. You see, growth is not an option for him because he needs to, to man- maintain that image that he feels is so important in his life. It's, a, it's a, a, an attitude that just literally stops growth in its tracks. You can't change, can't grow, because I've got it all together already. It's an amazing thing when somebody wants to grow. It really is. When people want to grow, they want to be the best that they can be. They want to improve. They don't see themselves as having having arrived at that position. And in most of our professions and whatever it is, now when I say in most of our professions, that may not be true, but but for, for a lot of us that are really engaged in something that is exciting and, and there's more future to us, we want to learn everything that we can learn. Uh, computer geeks, uh, you guys get so excited about learning something new, right? Huh? You know, now, there's some of us, and I hate to admit it, but yes, I'm one of those that really resist change when it comes to the computer. Uh, that's not, you know, I, too old, don't have enough time, you know, I just kind of block that out. It's not that priority for me. But for some of you, man, you'll read everything you get your hands on. You're, you're always wanting to learn. In the area of sports or whatever it may be or any kind of musical performance or whatever it is, you're always wanting to improve. You know, I'm amazed, you know, Nicholas doing as well as he is on the violin, he showed me some, some music that his uh, teacher is making him learn. Man, he's pushing him. Well, that's what you want, right? You know, with an athlete, you, you, you want to increase your vertical jump. You, you need to keep working on these things. You're always trying to improve. In the area of, of art, I remember how excited I was one time uh, years and years ago to find out that you can make gray without using black and white. You know, lively grays, grays that, that have some life to them. We'll take blue and orange and mix them together with a little white. And you've got a lively gray. Now, that attitude ought to be the attitude of every single believer in our spiritual life. We haven't attained. We're not already perfect. We've got a lot of room to grow. We ought to be excited about growing, changing from glory to glory. There always ought to be some kind of a goal ahead of us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, the apostle Paul talked about himself. And here's what he said. 
He said there in verse 12, not as though I'd already attained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, get a hold, that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The Lord has a hold of me. I want to get a hold of him. I want to know everything I can. Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, man, I'm not retiring. And Philippians was written from prison. I mean, by this time, Paul's ministry was coming to a conclusion. He'd written almost half of the New Testament. But he said, I haven't attained. No, I still want to be changed to a greater degree of glory, from glory to glory. Uh, I'm being changed by the Spirit of God. I want God to do a work in my heart and my life. Now, brand new Christians have that excitement. A brand new Christian wants to change. When you first get saved, it's a whole new life. It's an exciting life. There's so many adventures out there, so many things to learn, so much to learn from the Word of God. A brand new Christian usually is excited about growing. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's a whole new life. But you know, for older Christians, sometimes they lose that excitement. And I'm not sure why, but I think part of it is because as we get older in the Lord and we begin to take on more and more responsibilities, we begin to see ourselves in a leadership role. Now, leadership, not just being a pastor, but, but being a, a, a Christian, a mature Christian leader, being a parent, being a grandparent, those kind of things mean that we are, are being depended upon by others and others need to see us as strong. We need to be strong. We need to be capable. We need to be competent. We don't want people to see us as, 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 as weak. And I think so many times as older Christians, we get comfortable in this role. We're established. Uh, we're well-respected. And we no longer seeing ourselves as changing. We kind of see ourselves as having arrived. Now I mentioned this is that foolish pride. But I think this foolish pride is something that, that really, as older Christians, we're very susceptible to. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 6 says this. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. He warned him about those who are taking leadership positions within, within the Christian community. They're taking these leadership positions as a pastor or whatever it may be, but uh, it's going to make it difficult for them to keep growing and changing. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 says, Not a novice, talking about this individual that you're considering uh, in a, a role of a pastor. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall in the condemnation of the devil. And I think even as parents, many, many times, we have this kind of an attitude that if our kids see any weakness, uh, if they, they see us struggling in a certain area, then they may not respect that and take advantage of it or whatever it may be. No, we need to realize that each and every one of us ought to be continually growing in our relationship with the Lord. Continually. Do your children see you growing as their parent in the Lord? As a grandparent? As, as a leader within the church? Are we continually growing? That's God's command for us. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says, As a command... But grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We are commanded to grow. The moment we stop growing, we begin to backslide. And it's sad, but there are so many older Christians that no longer are, are growing. They've become stable in their, their life. They've become a fixture. they become rigid. And many times they become kind of cranky and ornery. Well, we've got to be growing. We want to continue to grow. Now, growth and change is not just to be changing. 
there's got to be a direction. There's got to be a reason for it. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. He says, be not conformed to this world. And see, conformed is a type of change, isn't it? This is, this is the wrong change. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. To be conformed means to change the, out, the outside appearance, to, to kind of uh, identify with others, to, to, to be conformed to them. In other words, to, to get along with others, to look like others, to appeal to others. Well, that's the wrong kind of a change. We need to be transformed. That's our word here of the metamorphosis. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or, or uh, uh, that you may experience what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so that change that is more like Christ, changed into his image, being conformed to him. That ought to be a lifelong process. Paul words it a little differently in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. In Galatians 4, 19, he talks about his, his desire as their spiritual leader, their, their, their spiritual father. He says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Now, the formed is the same word as transformed, except now the process is completed. Till Christ be formed, till we become Christ-like in every single area of our life. Is that your goal? Is that your desire, to be more and more like Christ every day? To continually change? Do you get up in the morning with that prayer on your lips saying, Lord, help me to be more conformed to the image of Christ today? Do you spend time in the Word of God? In order to be changed, in order to have this change attitude, this, this willingness to change, a desire to be what God wants us to be, it requires humility and transparency. It requires humility and transparency before God and His Word. Psalm 139, the psalmist ends Psalm 139, David, this way, verse 23 and 24. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Is that the way we pray? Do we pray, Lord, reveal to me that which is not acceptable? Any wicked way in me, Lord, show it to me. I, I, I really want to know. I want to change. I want to be able to confess it. I want to be able to forsake it. I want you to know my heart. I want you to try me. You see, the Word of God does a wonderful work in our life when we just spend that time in the Word of God. The example of Psalm 1. Look at verse 2. Psalm 1, verse 2 and 3. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It's the word of God that converts the soul. It's the word of God, God working through his word and his spirit that brings us to that place of a desire to be changed. And then secondly, a desire for change requires humility and transparency before God and before others. God gave us others to help us. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, talking about the church, to the church, and about the church here as we minister one to another, but speaking the truth in love. And the way it's worded here, I'm taking it out of context, but as a church, as, as individuals helping each other, speaking the truth in love. It's not enough just to speak the truth, but in love to speak the truth may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. We're going to become more and more like Christ as we stimulate and encourage each other in the things of the Lord. And we need each other to speak the truth in love, to confront us. Back in Proverbs 27, and there's several verses here that I want to look at in Proverbs 27. They talk about the relationship that we have as brothers and sisters with each other. 
and the importance of being able to be open and honest, transparent with each other. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. But the wounds of a friend, when somebody can come along and they have that freedom because we've given them that freedom to be able to share with us some of the areas that, that, that could be improved upon. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Verse 9, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. We ought to be able to hold each other accountable and, and encourage each other, that hearty counsel. Look at verse 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. As we're encouraging each other. God never intended us to be the lone ranger. We're not out here all by ourselves. We're, we're to encourage each other in the things of the Lord. Our goal is to be more like Christ. Verse, 20, verse 19, as in water, face answers to face, so the heart of man to man. That whole desire to be what God wants us to be, to be like him. We need to be open, that unveiled face. We need to be transparent and humble both before God and before others, with that desire and that goal of being conformed to the image of his Son. Our Heavenly Father, I just pray that you'll help us to, to put into reality the scriptures that we've read today. It's, it's one thing to sing a beautiful chorus, from glory to glory he's changing me, it's another thing to see that in reality in our life. I pray to you, Lord, for each and every one that's here that knows the Lord Jesus Christ, that their desire each and every day is to continue to grow and to become more like the Savior in every way. I realize there's always that possibility there are people here that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. I, I'm afraid that they might go away from this message today thinking about how difficult this Christian life is, always having to change and not understanding the reality of the Spirit of God working in their heart and their life. They need to come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Whatever that need may be, I pray that you'll work on our hearts today, accomplish your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would please take your, no, you don't take your hymnal today. The invitation hymn is more like the master. I couldn't find it in the hymnal. And most of you know it, don't you? It's an old, old hymn, more like the master I want to be. Uh, it's up here on the screen. And uh, so we'll sing it that way this morning. Uh, I will just give a general invitation. If we can help, if we can encourage, if you want to pray with somebody, man, we'd be delighted to pray with you. If you're not sure what it means to be saved, uh, we'd be just delighted to be able to sit down with you and show you from the Bible how to be saved. Uh, any public decision, church membership, baptism, always appropriate at a service like this. Let's stand together as we sing that first stanza. Whatever we can do to help, please give us the opportunity. More like the 